President. The, uh, the majority whip is recognized. Madam President, many people who follow the Senate may be asking a basic question. What are you doing? Why is it that the Senate is only voting once every other day, or why does it seem like it's every other day? Why aren't you at business? If you're here this weekend, can't you have something to do of positive nature for this country? It's a reasonable question. I'd like to describe where we are at this moment and where I hope we will be soon. It started with the President of the United States asking for a defense supplemental bill, a supplemental bill for military spending. There were several major priorities in that measure asked for by the President. One, of course, was the war in the Ukraine and our continued support of the Ukrainian effort to stop the ruthless invasion of Vladimir Putin and the Russians. This has been going on for two years and we have been standing by the Ukrainians, and they were running out of money, equipment, and ammunition. President Biden stepped up and said, we're going to provide assistance to Ukraine as part of this emergency supplemental. The same thing is true when it comes to the Israelis fighting the terrorist Hamas after the invasion of their country on October 7th. There was money to provide assistance to them in their effort to end that terrorism that had such a dramatic negative impact on Israel. Third provision relates to Taiwan and the Asian theater. They too are friends and allies and needed assistance from the United States. Equally important, a substantial humanitarian aid package needed in many places around the world, including Gaza, that is part of this package four critical priorities that in the usual course of business would be approved on a bipartisan basis, but not this time. This time, many of the Republican leaders in the Senate said, we will not consider these important subjects without some provision dealing with America's border security. It is true, I think it's obvious, that the situation on our southern border is currently unsustainable and needed to be changed. The Republicans insisted this would be part of the package. There was no argument on our side of the aisle. We sat down to find a solution. Now, the solutions relating to immigration are elusive. I know that as well as anybody. We've spent three decades trying to come up with immigration reform legislation. Virtually both parties concede that our immigration system in its entirety is a shambles and needs to be rewritten. And so the suggestion was made, we put together a bipartisan committee to put together a, an alternative on border security to be added to this package that I just described. The Republicans said that they wanted James Langford of Oklahoma to speak for them. Several of them came to me and said he has worked on this long and hard. He's prepared to accept the task of brokering a bipartisan solution to the border and we trust him. We want him to be the spokesman for the Republican side. No objection on this side of the table. Two senators joined him in that bipartisan effort. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. They worked for weeks and weeks and weeks to put together a bipartisan border security package, and they finally succeeded. The Republicans said, we don't want to move on that type of a package unless we have 72 hours to carefully review it before we take the first vote. Senator Schumer, the Democratic leader, said that's a reasonable request, and he filed the original version of this bill last Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> then in the following Wednesday of this week we're closing, we brought this matter to the floor. To our surprise, the Republicans reversed their position on border security and despite the best efforts of James Lankford, on behalf of the Republicans, decided that overwhelmingly they were going to reject any border security measure. Why the change of heart on the Republican side? The cause is very obvious and very public. Donald Trump, the putative Republican nominee for president, announced that he was opposed to the package. Republican senators 
who were open to it or supported it walked away from it. And in walking away from it, did not produce enough votes for us to bring the border security measure up uh, as part of this package. Think about that for a second. We were told for months that we couldn't move on the underlying bill because we didn't have a border security proposal. We put together a bipartisan proposal. We brought it to the floor, and the same Republicans who were insisting on border security as part of this package turned on it and opposed it. We took the vote, which told the story. And at that point, Senator Schumer said, we'll move forward with the rest of the package. That Those measures are now pending before the United States Senate and do not include border security, at least in the package produced by the bipartisan group. I think what I've just given you is a rough summary of where we stand at this moment. So we're going through the laboring, labored process under the Senate rules of burning hours off of the clock, 30 hours at a time, until we can reach these seminal roll calls to determine whether we move forward. As uh, Senator Schumer just said a few minutes ago, we face the next one of those roll calls uh, next tomorrow around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That's 30 hours after the last vote. But there's a way to avoid this kind of inactivity on the floor of the Senate and to really get to the questions at hand. And that is what we normally do, a unanimous consent, both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican, to take up certain amendments or measures. We are at that point. We should be moving toward that so that we can finish our work on this important legislation and go home for a break uh, over the President's holidays. We don't know what's going to happen today if we follow the book and don't reach a unanimous consent agreement. Uh, there may be little or nothing happening on the floor today. But if we can reach a bipartisan agreement on a list of acceptable amendments on both sides of the aisle, we can move forward and the Senate can be the Senate as it should be. That's what's pending. So that is a rough summary of where we stand. I'm disappointed that a good faith effort by these three senators that produced a measure, which though I don't agree with it in every detail, is a reasonable step forward, has been summarily rejected by most Senate Republicans. Senator Lankford, I listened to him on the floor. He spent 30 minutes explaining what was in this package. There are some things that are absolutely necessary. Resources at the border that we know that we need. People, professional people, to deal with the onslaught of refugees and asylees who are coming to our border. In addition to that, money for technology. Doesn't everyone concede on both sides of the aisle that we need to do everything humanly possible to stop the flow of narcotics, particularly fentanyl, into the United States? I don't think that's even debatable. The bill that Langford and the others proposed had provisions in there and resources to accomplish that goal. The same thing is true when it comes to resolving the status of people who present themselves at the border. There are people who are desperate and fearful of the, for their lives staying in certain countries escaping to the United States in the hopes that they'll be safe. For more than 50 years, we have honored that uh, pursuit and given a means for people to reach their goal. Now the standards are going to be tougher under the Langford legislation, and it means that people are going to be held to a higher standard. Also provisions that those who are at the border will have their cases ultimately resolved in a much more expeditious way. I think we all agree that waiting one year, two years, five years or more uh, really creates a, a hardship on the system and uncertainty that needs to be resolved. It takes more immigration judges and people at the administrative level to process it, and the Langford bill did that. Now, what I've just described in the provisions of the Langford uh, bipartisan bill was rejected by the majority of Republicans because Donald Trump announced that he was against it. He went so far as to say, blame me if we do nothing on border security. Well, I certainly think he's deserving of blame. He stopped Republicans who were positive on this subject from moving forward and helping us to do something positive on the immigration front. There's another part of this story that I want to speak to very quickly this morning, and it relates to a measure that I introduced in, in the Senate almost 20 years ago. It's called the DREAM Act. Yesterday, with Senators Padilla, Cortez Masto, and others, I filed an amendment to offer the DREAM Act as an amendment to this bill. 
as part of the package if we're going to have a bipartisan package of amendments. I introduced this legislation, as I said, more than 20 years ago. It provides a path to citizenship for young immigrants who were brought to the United States as children and allows them to remain in the United States at their home. These are kids brought here by their parents. There wasn't a family vote or a family decision. They were kids and they didn't went where mom and dad told them to. They ended up in the United States, undocumented. They went to school here. They stood up each morning in the classroom and pledged allegiance to that same flag we just pledged allegiance to. They believed they were part of this country and it wasn't until they were usually 10 or 12 years old that their parents leveled with them and told them, your legal status is uncertain. You're undocumented. We don't know what your future holds. Be careful. If you're not careful, you could be deported and we could be deported with you. That terrible circumstance prevailed for hundreds of thousands of young people in this country. The DREAM Act said, give them a chance. Give them a chance to earn their pathway to citizenship. That's what the bill said when it was introduced. They know no other home, and yet without congressional action, they spend every day in fear of deportation. Let me tell you about one of these dreamers. Her name is Tatiana Vasquez Lopez. She attends college in my home state of Illinois. This is the 140th time that I've told the story of a dreamer here on the floor of the United States Senate. I can make speeches about the subject, but if you meet these young people and hear their life story, it's a much more convincing experience. Tatiana was born in Guatemala, came to the United States when she was 11 months old. She grew up in Alabama and became an important part of her community. She volunteered at a local church during the COVID pandemic to help families in need. She also completed a teaching internship during which she visited schools across the school system to support teachers and students. And she did all this while she was in high school. Tatiana is currently studying at Dominican University in River Forest, my home state of Illinois. She is the leader in the Chicagoland community as president of the Organization of Latin American Students. What is her goal? A PhD in psychiatry so she can work as a trauma therapist helping families and children. She wants to continue giving back to communities in need and helping provide life-saving resources to others, resources she wished her family had received when they came to the United States. She's currently protected from deportation thanks to the DACA program. DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. The DACA program was an outgrowth of the DREAM Act. When we couldn't pass the DREAM Act on the floor of the Senate, former Senator Barack Obama from Illinois, as President of the United States, was uh, importuned to consider doing it by executive action. I wrote a letter, for, the first letter, to President Obama, co-signed by Richard Lugar, the late Republican Senator from Indiana, asking Barack Obama to consider executive action to protect young people like Tatiana. Then I sent another letter with about 23 Democratic senators supporting the same goal. Fortunately for us, Obama was a co-sponsor of the DREAM Act and he agrees with our goal in this legislation and he went to work to create DACA. That program that he established has changed hundreds of thousands of young lives like Tatiana's. DACA has protected more than 800,000 young people in America from deportation and it's allowed them to pursue higher education and enter our workforce. Unfortunately, since President Obama established the program, Republicans have waged a relentless campaign to overturn it and deport these young dreamers back to countries they may not even remember. Last September, a federal judge in Texas declared the DACA program was illegal, though the decision left in place protections for current DACA recipients like Tatiana while the appeal is pending, all of them live in fear that the next court decision will dramatically change their lives. Until a permanent solution is written into law, Tatiana's service to her community is at risk, as is the service of dreamers who work as doctors, teachers, engineers, and so much more across America. I introduced the DREAM Act, as I said, more than 20 years ago to provide a solution, a path to citizenship for dreamers. 
that solution is long overdue and should be acted on as quickly as possible. We should all be able to agree that dreamers only make America better, and we in Congress must do better by them. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the dreamers and work with me to provide them with a path to be part of America's future. This amendment would do just that. Madam President, I yield the floor.